Okay guys, so today we'll be going through the multiple choice. Let me just share my screen to you guys quickly. Desktop, whole screen. Okay. Cool. Can you guys see my screen? I assume you can. We haven't had problems before. Let me also make sure that I can see the chat actually. Should I put this in like the top? I don't know. I guess the top right is fine. Okay, cool. Everyone can see my screen, no problem. Please post yes in the chat if you can. And yeah, go to, if you have your textbooks with you, hopefully you do, go to page 60 or just um, have a piece of paper, you know, with the, like numbers 1 to 10 so that you can note down the answers. Awesome, you guys can see, good stuff. So let's just get started then. Okay, so I, I imagine you guys remember we did something similar to this uh, before. Last time I did the fill in the blanks questions as well, but if you recall last week I asked you guys to do those yourselves. Um, if you haven't, I suppose it's not the biggest issue because you will be answering questions very similar to those at some point. Oh, okay, see Thelma and Veda Granny joined us now, so um, that's two extras. Okay, I must just remember to mark you guys on the register at the end. Um, cool, you haven't missed anything. We're starting with the multiple choice questions on page 60 of your textbook. Okay, so question one. We're going to try to do this a bit cooperatively as usual. Um, obviously, I'm going to have to switch to check out the chat as well. So find the, text, find the question in your textbook so that you can answer it there. Okay, this first one I think should be fairly easy if, if we remember the definitions of public, private, and protected. So the question states, you want to restrict the access for a method to the containing class or to a class that is derived from the containing class. Which access modifier should you use for this method? Um, A, public, B, private, C, protected, or D, internal. So what do we, got, what do we think, guys? Okay, Connor says C. Do we have any other answers, any other potential answers? If you agree with Connor, then just like his... Um, his comment there. Any anyone else have an opinion on that? Um, do we want to do we, we want to revise these definitions um, quickly as well? So where are we? Where are we? In in the textbook, we're on page sixty, question one of the multiple choice section. But you see, you want to restrict the access for a method to the containing class or to a class that is derived from the containing class. Oh, you got disconnected. Oh, okay, cool. Well, page 60 of the textbook. Um, okay, Saham so says C as well. So, any anyone disagree? Okay, I hope not, because, okay, someone likes Saham's comments as well. Awesome. Yeah, uh, Connor and Saham were correct on that, and whoever liked Saham's comments as well. Um, the, the answer is C. Does anyone want to go over this one more time? I feel like we've covered it a lot, so maybe we can discuss it briefly. Okay, so public, public means that the, the, um, the method would be accessible anywhere, okay, in any class, um, that's what public would mean, it's accessible anywhere. Private means that it's only accessible inside the containing class, okay, only accessible inside the containing class, and protected means that it's accessible inside the containing class, it's accessible inside any class that inherits from the containing class, which is a derived class, okay? And it's not accessible anywhere else. All right, so yeah, Connor and Sam were correct. Um, hopefully you guys are comfortable with this idea. If you're not, um, the, the, there was a YouTube video where we covered this um, in a lot of detail. So question two. This is getting a little bit more difficult, and, and I think we might have to discuss this one, but, but we let's see, let's see what you guys think. In a class, you defined a method called render. Okay. This method provides functionality to render bitmap files on the screen. Okay, that sentence is just trying to throw you off, so you ignore that second sentence. You would like the derived classes to supersede this functionality to support the rendering of additional image formats. Okay, so we have a method somewhere. It defines a particular way of doing things. All right, we want the methods in our derived classes to be able to change that functionality. You also want the render method of the derived classes to be executed even if the derived class is cast as the base class. 
Okay, that wording might throw you off a bit, but you don't really need to think about that to answer this, this particular question. So this sentence as well, um, just ignore that. Your, your knowledge should be able to take you through it. Which keyword would you, should you use with the definition of the render method in the base class? Okay. Wow, guys, okay. We've got two Bs. Um, hmm. I'm impressed by you guys. So, okay, Connor, you say B as well. That's good. Okay. I am just going to go through these things um, quickly, uh, just, just so that we can do this deductively as well, all right, because that way we get more value out of the question. Okay, so let's just start with D, internal. It's not internal, okay? Internal has to do with security, right? The word internal, when we think of that word, we must also think of words like public, private, and protected, okay? Internal is a, is a different concept, so it has nothing to do with what we're discussing here. New, we've seen the word new before, but it was also in a different context, right? That was when we're creating a new object, when we say like um, vampire vamp equals new vampire, right? That's where we've seen the word new before. And so we don't really have to think about it in this context. So really we're thinking about abstract and we're thinking about virtual. Okay, so I'm gonna just type up a little example showing you the difference between abstract and virtual, just in case anyone in the classes is um, struggling with, with that, that, cause it is quite a subtle, it's quite a subtle thing. Okay. So in order to see this difference, we will need a class, we need a base class and we need a class that inherits from it. So I think um, maybe an idea that got through to you guys is, to, is, is the enemy. Okay, so we can define the general idea of an enemy. So I'll say class enemy. Okay, class enemy. Our enemies need to be able to attack. Okay, so I'm going to say public void attack. Okay, something like that. And the enemy's attack in this case is just going to be a very, very general thing. Okay. So this will be something like the enemy hits you. Okay, the enemy hits you. Okay, so that's all our enemy does. But we want more specific enemies, more uh, interesting enemies. Okay, so for example, a vampire. So to create a vampire, I might say, okay, I've got a class vampire and it inherits, okay, we use a colon for that, from enemy. My vampire is also able to attack, right? The vampire must also be able to attack. And so we would say something like public, we would use the word override, right? You're familiar with that word, override, void attack. And then the vampire will do something more interesting than just bite you. It'll say console.writeline The vampire sucks your blood. Okay, cool. So we've now got a vampire. All right. This currently um, will, will cause problems for us. So let me just show you that when I run this. Um, it might be because, because we haven't actually created a vampire yet. Okay, cool. It does, still does give us the problem. So it says vampire.attack cannot override inherited member enemy.attack because it is not set it is not marked virtual, abstract, or override. But we're, we're thinking about virtual and abstract here. Okay. And all the questions are about virtual and abstract. Okay. So what it's saying is we have to mark this as either virtual or abstract. So let's just discuss the difference between these two things. Okay. If I mark it virtual, then it's going to stop complaining now. Okay. Totally. Um, this, this will now work. Let me zoom out a little bit. Um, so I run that, okay, and you see it stops complaining. There's no error. So it's happy with us defining this. So we can define public virtual void attack, and we can tell, generally speaking, an enemy, unless specified otherwise, will attack like this. The enemy hits you. Okay, quite, a, quite boring attack functionality. Okay, virtual allows us to define this, and if we want to, we can also override it. We can change it. So in this case, when we create a vampire, the attack method will instead say the vampire sucks your blood instead of the enemy hits you. Okay. The other option is to call this abstract. Okay, abstract. 
I also have to make the class abstract if I do that. Okay. But now this will still complain. It's going to shout at me and it's going to say enemy.attack cannot declare a body because it is marked abstract. Okay, so now we've marked the attack method inside enemy as abstract. And it's complaining that it cannot declare a body. If you guys remember, this is the body the between the two curly brackets. Okay, so what it's complaining about is that because it's abstract, we cannot define that body. Okay, it has to be empty like this. You see, it stops complaining. So now it's now it's fine. So you can't actually specify an attack for a general enemy if the attack method is marked as abstract. All right. So that was the difference between abstract and virtual. It seems like most of you guys managed to remember that. So so well done on that. And yeah, the answer to question two is B, virtual. Okay. Question three. Uh, another. Hmm. Actually, it's not too bad. This one's this one. You guys should also be pretty comfortable with. So the question asks. You define a class advmath that defines advanced mathematical functionality. Okay, so we've got a class defining something. You do not want the functionality of this class to be inherited into a derived class. Okay, so I don't want to be able to inherit from this class. I can only instantiate it directly into objects. That's what it's saying. What keywords should you use to define the advmath class? A, sealed, B, abstract, C, private, or D, internal? Someone says abstract. That's interesting. What what other possibilities are there? So, so Connor says a sealed. Okay. So so we've got one a we've got two a's now and one b. Oops, sealed. Yeah yeah. Okay. Ria Ria says a. No 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 no. Connor, stick to your guts here. Stick to your guts here. But uh, but I like you are seeing a correlation between private and sealed which which is which is pretty good um but yeah a lot of you guys now have answered and and yes you guys are correct it is sealed and and i'm impressed guys well done you you're doing well on this test so far you've you've managed to get a lot of them okay so there were really uh, again we know that the answer is sealed now but but i want to i still want to discuss um the other possibilities okay so they so c and d okay private and internal we're not talking about encapsulation here right we're not talking about a thing inside the class that we're trying to make inaccessible outside the class or inaccessible in particular cases so we're not talking about the words private or internal we're talking about the concept of inheritance right and on the concept of inheritance we've seen both of these words sealed and abstract okay so let's think about what they mean if i make a class abstract hopefully you guys remember that if a class is abstract, we've, we've got one here, right? If a class is abstract, and I try to say, so you see enemy is an abstract class. If I try to say enemy n equals new enemy, okay? It's going to complain now, right? So it says you cannot create an instance of the abstract class or interface enemy. Okay, so because it's abstract, I cannot actually declare an object of it. I cannot instantiate an object of that type because it's abstract. I can only inherit from it. Okay. Now, that's not what the question is asking us here, right? The question is saying um, we, we don't want to be able to inherit from it. So we've got an abstract class right here and we're inheriting from it. Okay. Let's say I don't want you to be able to inherit from the class vampire. I don't want you to be able to say class. What's a special kind of vampire? Um, class. Uh, you guys probably haven't seen the movie Day War, um, Blade, but but whatever. Actually, out of interest, have any of you seen Blade? I wonder. Blade was very good. Okay. Anyway, so we have class Daywalker vampire. So this is a vampire that can walk during the day. It can go outside during the day. Okay. So. Say we don't want this to be able to happen. We don't want you to be able to inherit from the class vampire. You see, currently it doesn't complain. Daywalker can inherit from vampire. But I don't want you to be able to create special types of vampires. That's getting too complicated. So I want to ban this. I want to say you're not allowed to inherit from this class. Okay. Then we say sealed. Okay. We add this word sealed, and that means you're no longer allowed to inherit from it. Um, so you'll see now it'll complain 
It says Daywalker cannot derive from sealed type vampire. Okay, so that's just the difference between the words abstract and sealed. Um, yeah, and and yeah, you can sort of see like a correlation, right? So sealed is is a more secure kind of way of doing things, right? So it like it just makes it more secure. You're not allowed to inherit from vampire. Abstract is saying you have to inherit from enemy. You can't do anything with it otherwise. Okay. Cool. Okay, you haven't seen it. Um, it it is it is interesting. And maybe maybe when you guys are older, you should give it a watch. It's pretty cool. Okay. Uh, okay, my computer's freezing up a little bit, so that's not always nice. Question four. Okay, you need to provide query. Ooh, this this one might be a little bit difficult, but but let's see let's see how how you guys deal with it. You need to provide query functionality to several of your classes. All right. Each class's algorithm for the query will likely be different. Also, not all the classes have A, that should be A, not end, or N, whatever, um, have A is a relationship with each other. Um, how should you support this functionality? Okay. So the first option they give is, Add the query functionality to a base class with the public access modifier. Okay, uh, don't worry, we'll discuss all the options in more detail um, in a bit. B, have all the classes inherit from an abstract base class and override the base class method to provide their own query functionality. Okay, a little bit of a complicated way to do it, do it but maybe. C, have all the classes inherit from a base class that provides the query functionality. Or D, Create a common interface that is implemented by all the classes. Wow. Okay. So, cool. so we've already got one answer. Okay. So Jatin says 4D. Someone agrees with him. Um, do we do we have any other ideas, guys? Okay. Yuvia also says D. Wow. Okay. I'm not sure if it's my discussion that made it obvious, or if you guys really are just geniuses, but you guys are correct. So that's it is D. Um, Okay, but I, I again, we're, we're going to discuss all of the other options just because um, it's more helpful that way, right? Because we could have also just guessed and we would have a one-fourth chance of getting D. Okay, so, so option A was add the query functionality to a base class with the public access modifier. All right, so, so let's consider what they're asking us. They're saying we need to provide query functionality. So let's, let's just... Um, we, we have been getting through this quite speedily because you guys have been answering all the questions. So although the, the other questions might take us a little bit longer, but so, so let's do this quickly. Um, we'll say class base class. Okay, class base class, uh, whatever, class base. And we'll say class derived. Okay, so the first option they give us is to define the query functionality here. So they say public, um, uh, we would say something like public virtual uh, void query, right? So this is kind of the first option they're giving us. Would we define it like that? And then all of the different derived classes, and there'll be lots of them, would inherit from base. So that's kind of what they're suggesting in option A. Add the query functionality to a base class with the public access modifier. So they say public access modifier here, um, but like obviously you would have to access it. So clearly the, this question is also just trying to throw you off. So you need to provide the query functionality to several of your classes. They say each class's algorithm for the query will likely be different. Well now, actually you see they also only say public, so they didn't even say virtual. So they're literally describing this even. And this is obviously wrong now, right? Because all of the derived classes would have the exact same query functionality. And they say specifically, each class's algorithm for the query will likely be different. Okay, so option A is clearly wrong. Have all the classes inherit from an abstract base class and override the base class method to provide their own query functionality. Okay, this is a little bit more convincing, right? Because now they're saying abstract. And then we say public abstract query. And then we override it here. Okay, public override void query. And and each base class would give their own their own little implementation. Hmm. 
So you remember I said this one was pretty close, right? I, I think B, B is, it's pretty difficult to not say B. Again, you guys followed your instinct for D and that's good, okay? Because because D definitely is the most sensible way to do it. B is a little bit of a confusing way to do it. Why? Because in a way, interfaces are kind of just um, public abstract classes, okay? Like everything is abstract and public. But what this has to do is, has to do with is this also not all the classes have a is a relationship with each other okay so so the interface can be inherited like there can be multiple inheritance with interfaces so like if i have a interface for queries okay i can have a bunch of different classes that don't inherit the same thing and all of them can just inherit this query interface okay but again whenever you guys hear something like this where it's there's multiple different classes that have slightly different implementations of the same method. You just think about our attack example with our game and you should instantly go interface, which I think that's what you guys have been doing. So that's good. Have all the classes inherit from a base class that provides the query functionality. Option C is kind of similar to option A. Um, they're both wrong. Okay, but but well done, well done on getting D, guys. Well done on getting D. Okay, question five. This one, hmm, let me think about this. Uh, which method of the following case? Actually, no, you guys should get this one too. Which of the following class elements should you use to define the behavior of a class? So we're defining the behavior of a class. A, method, B, property, C, event, or D, delegate. So we're defining behavior here. Okay, so <clears throat> let's see. We've got um, 5A, Connor says B. What was B? B was property. Okay. Um, Uvia says A. All right. <coughs> Veragrani says A. That's good. Good. Okay, cool. We, we've got four possible answers here. So I'm, I'm glad. So, so you guys all said either A or B. All right. Um, with most people saying A. And, and A is the correct answer. But if you chose B as a second option, that's better than nothing. Honestly, that is better than nothing because it is mean you're, think you're thinking along the correct lines. So what we can immediately know is it's not an event and it's not a delegate. Okay, An event is kind of just a list of methods that you can call. And a delegate is a special kind or like a signature for methods. Okay, So it's not event or delegate that's overcomplicating things. You're right in thinking it would either be method or property, right? Because these are the elements of our class that we would use that we kind of use in similar ways and very commonly, okay? But the, the difference lies in a property isn't storing behavior. Okay, so let me say uh, we can just create our class space, all right? So we've got a little class here, okay? So let's say, um, let's, let's say we were making a class car, okay? So we we cl cars have certain things all right they they just have certain things that are um that are easily definable all right like they'll have a number of wheels right that's the common example and they'll have a brand so we might say like something like public string brand right get set okay this is what we would call a property um we might say public int num wheels get set right that's another property so you can see all of these prop uh, these properties are kind of like attributes of the class okay all cars have a certain number of wheels they have a certain brand um, they might have a certain color right we might say public string color uh, get set okay so um, these these are what we would call properties right but a car would also have behavior right like the idea of accelerating like ac accelerating the car or steering the car that's a complex step-by-step -step process right that's a behavior so more c or like filling it with fuel these these things are more complicated starting the engine turning on the radio you can see that i can't just define these in terms of a variable right it's not a single variable there's these are complex procedures right and those kinds of things we would have to create a method for, right? Like public void accelerate. Uh, okay, uh, is that correct? Accelerate. Um, we could also say public 
void, um, uh, which one did we say? Turn on radio, turn on radio. Okay, there are, there are steps to performing these, these things. They're like algorithms, right? They would each require their own flow charts, if you like. So these things are what we would call methods, all right? So that was just the difference between properties and methods. Okay. But, but I, I think it's a, it's a easy, that's an easy thing to correct if, if you were thinking about it incorrectly or whatever. But also a um, simple mistake, really. Okay, so, so a method, and, and I mean, you can think about it in terms of the word, right? So property, attribute, those aren't behaviors, right? I wouldn't say my ability, um, um, the number of legs I have, that's not a behavior, right? My, my hair color is not a behavior. But running, eating, these are behaviors, okay? So an object can do, can do complex things and it can have things. The things it have, we call those properties or attributes. And the things it can do, we call methods. All right. Anyway, not a bad question. Now I would say, I mean, actually, I thought that you guys would struggle more with the other questions. I think some of my other students did. But, but you guys have managed quite well. I think this one, actually, this one you guys might also get quite nicely. So uh, the question asks, you are writing code for a class named product. Okay, so we have class product. You need to make sure that the data members of the class, okay, data members, a bit of a tricky term, but hopefully when you see that, you're thinking property. The data members of the class are initialized to their correct values as soon as you create an object of the product class. So as soon as we create a new type of product, all of its properties must be initialized. The initialization code should be always executed. So must always execute. What should you do? A, create a static method in the product class to initialize data members. Hmm. Create a constructor in the product class to initialize data members. Create a static property in the product class to initialize data members. Or create an event in the product class to initialize data members. What do we think, guys? Uh, wait, was that answering? Was Saham, was this? A? I can't tell now. Okay, Yuvia's answer was for the previous question. And Veda Granny's was as well. So Saham's answer here, A. This was, this was the first answer we have to this question. Okay, so some people are saying A. Right, interesting. Also, Ham is saying A. Do, do we have any other? So he's saying creates a static method in the product class to initialize data members. Is that how we would do it, Saham? Okay, someone says, <coughs> okay, or C, interesting. Okay, or D, <laughs> six B. Okay, Yuvia says B, and coming out strong. Ria also says B. Good stuff. Okay, I, I think okay maybe this question warrants a bit of discussion. I think um you'll you guys will hit yourself when when you see the answer. Um, <clears throat> so the answer is B. Create a constructor. Um, maybe it's because of the way they've worded this question. So let's just see. They're saying. The data members of the class are initialized to the correct values. Okay, so we 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 have this class product, okay, class product, and and they say it has a bunch of data members. Okay, so let's think about what these data members would be. <coughs> and when they say data members, they're just trying to throw you off. What they actually mean is properties, basically. Again, they use a billion different words for the same things, right? So. Let's just see, let's give, give us some examples. So we might have a price, right? That would be a double. Public int um, price get set. Okay. The product is only obviously going to have a name, right? So we could say like public string name get set. Okay. So here we've got a product. Obviously, we could add a bunch more things like a barcode or whatever. A barcode, a brand, a location, a shop, whatever. But but just for now, let's keep it keep it simple and say this is our product. Our products have prices and names. These are what they're referring to when they say data members. Now, if you had seen this example before, <laughs> okay. So Sahama, so you're saying what? Because now it makes sense. Or, but yeah, they can get tricky with the wording. Okay, they can get tricky with the wording. 
Um, but hopefully now it makes... You're confused now. Are you, are you confused about why these are called data members in the question and not properties or what's up? Yeah, okay. Again, it's it's just like a, it's a synonym, right? Like they'll use they'll use different words for the same things all the time. Um just cuz just to throw you off basically. It's the only way they can make the test difficult. So they're just using data members. <coughs> Think about it this way. So properties uh properties um events uh delegates what what other things do we have methods all of these things can be held inside classes right all of these things can be held inside classes these are what we would what whichever ones it has so if there's like a property and an event and a delegate inside a class we would call those things the members of the class okay that's sh that you should be pretty comfortable with okay so whichever one of these things whatever's inside the class we would call that a member of the class so when they use the term data dash member, okay, what they mean here is a member in the class, okay, any member in the class that is holding data, okay, that holds data, all right, and and when we think about members that hold data, they're going to be variables, right? They're going to be properties. So price is holding a particular type of data in in a double, okay. Name is holding a particular type of data in a string. Okay, so they're just using different language to throw you off. Don't worry too much about it. Okay. Cool. That's that's good. Uh, yeah, it's no problem. They, they're clearly being tricky with their wording. All right, they're clearly being tricky with the wording. Okay, but now you guys can probably see, now that I've worded it like this, you can probably see, obviously, it's a constructor, right? We have price and name Every time I create a new product, when I go like product um, muesli equals new product, every time I create a new product, I want it to have to set the price and the name, right? And obviously, we would specify that there if we if we had a constructor. Okay, so now you guys know. Okay, obviously, we would have to create a product constructor. Um, it would take in the price and the name. And then we would go ahead and just set price to price and name to name. And let's just make sure. So, so in the question, they tell you all of the things that must be true about this. So they say, you need to make sure that the data members of the class are initialized to their correct values as soon as you create an object of the product class. The initialization code should always execute. Okay, so it needs to run and set things to their appropriate values as soon as you create a new object. So the constructor would do that, right? And also, it needs to always execute. Always. Okay, whenever you create a new product, it must always execute. And and the, the constructor is, is that too, right? It will also do that. Okay, but I mean, just for interest sake, since we are a bit ahead of time, why don't we consider the other options here? right and and see maybe like why why they would be wrong just just as like a sort of thought thought experiment so they say create a static method in the product class to initialize the data members i suppose that's possible right we could say something like static um a static void or public it would have to be public as well public static void initialize or something right and we could make this method take in a price and a name, right? And then we would set price to price and name to name, for example. And then how we would have to do this is after we create the product, we would have to say muesli, which is the name of our object, okay? Dot initialize. And, and we would have to specify the price oh sorry it must take in double price i'm sorry about that i would we would have to specify the name of the product and the price right 
I, I suppose it could work, but what's wrong with this? They say it must always be executed. This won't always be executed. If you don't call initialize, this won't run, right? So, so it doesn't answer the question, basically. This, this isn't the ideal way of doing this. Okay. It also doesn't run as soon as you create the product. So yeah, it, it's, it wouldn't be A. Um, B, create a static pro property in the product class to, do, to initialize data members. They say create a static property. So they're saying they're saying something like this public what like static string name I don't know this seems very weird like why we wouldn't want to do this okay so we wouldn't do it that way and create an event that's just overcomplicating things right I'm not going to create an event to initialize just to initialize a class that's that's massively overcomplicating things Okay, so that was question six. I'd see uh, after after you know what what they mean by data members. Hopefully, you guys would find that one quite easy. Okay, um, so we are we'll do this last one and then probably take a break. And we are speeding through this way too quickly. Although there is there is some difficult difficult concepts coming up, so perhaps we'll take the time then. Okay, so this question actually I think this was one of the difficult ones. Uh, Okay, let's just read it. You are creating a class named square that is derived from the polygon class. Okay, we've, we've seen this exactly, actually. We've coded this ourselves. The polygon, class, the polygon class has the following code. Class, polygon, public, virtual, void, draw. Okay, so they've made it virtual and they haven't declared a body. That's fine, it's allowed. The body is empty, um, but, but that's totally fine. The draw method in the square class should provide new functionality, but also hide the polygon class implementation of the draw method. Which code segment should you use to accomplish this? Okay, and they give you four different code segments there. I didn't write out the whole things, but basically the only thing that changes about each of them is the word that they put before void, right? So in one of them, they say public override void draw. In the next one, they say public new void draw. In the next one, they say public virtual void draw. And in the last one, they say public static void draw. Okay. This one is going to require some discussion about some of the finer points of C sharp. Okay. Um, I am interested to see what you guys would suggest initially. Okay. So I think let's, let's do our break now. I'm thinking we, we are speeding through this very quickly. So, let's maybe take a five minute break. We'll come back at like 3.46, 3.46, and then we'll continue with the rest of this. Um, but until then, you know, go get some water and, and stuff like that, but then also just answer the question. Okay, tell me, tell me what you think about the question so far. And then we'll actually program out. So what is virtual void? Well, you, you know what virtual means, Yuvia. We discussed it earlier today, right? Are you saying so in the are you asking that in seven in seven? We know what virtual means, right? It was virtual or abstract. Those were the two things we could pick virtual allows us to still declare a body for that method and then still override it or whatever later and and oh, and if we made it abstract, then we wouldn't be allowed to declare a body as to what virtual means as a possible answer. Well, I don't know. It might break might not even work, right? The code that they give you and the answers might not necessarily be be correct. Um, my intuition is no, no, it's not allowed. Shall we, shall we see? I think they're just adding that as a potential trick question. But also whether or not it is or isn't, like whether or not C Sharp has defined it um, is different from whether or not we would ever use it. But let's go ahead um, during the break, I guess I will just quickly program up the, the code example that they have in the book. So they say public virtual void draw and, and they just leave it empty like so. Okay, public virtual void draw. And then they say there's another class square that inherits from polygon like so. And in this class square, we need to, oh, um, we need to change the <laughs> We need to change um, the implementation. So what the one that um, Yuvia asked us to check out is public virtual void draw. So what would this do? Ah, we must say OK, 
Okay, and I'm gonna say, I'm gonna provide a new implementation here. So I'll say console.writeLine, um, and I'll say squares draw method. Actually, you know what? I'll, I'm gonna make it so that, I'm gonna change their example slightly. It's not a huge change. I'm gonna make it so that the method is no longer empty. Okay, they made it virtual and left the body empty. I'm just gonna make it so that instead of being empty, it prints out polygon. Okay, so that we know which um, which one it's using, right? Hopefully you guys can understand that. So I'm just making it so that the, the polygon implementation of draw prints out polygon, the square implementation of draw prints out square. Okay, and then we'll go ahead and create a square object, which we'll say square sqr equals new square, something like that. Okay, and when I run this, I assume, okay, it does, it does, um, run which is interesting let me say if i go square dot draw what what happens interesting it prints out square let me try going polygon square prints out polygon okay interesting so virtual is properly defined in this context which which is interesting but we'll discuss these subtleties a little bit more uvia afterwards but but um like with most programming there is a billion different ways to do things. Um, just because it works doesn't mean it's correct. Okay, because like C, the, the way C sharp does things, there'll be a bunch of weird hidden things. That's why we have these standards. Okay, you can think about it as similar to a normal language as well. Okay, because I was programming right through the break, I'm just going to go get myself some water quickly. I'll come back quickly though, and hopefully we'll still get started at uh, 15.46, and then we'll discuss question seven in detail. Dang, one minute late. Yeah, the meeting's being recorded. Okay, sorry about that, guys. Cool. Let's discuss question seven. Okay. Cool. So, um, we, I've we've got the question here, but but I've I've programmed it programmed it up now as well. So, we've we've kind of seen a very similar thing going on before. Okay, so let me, let's just set up this example a bit. Okay, so we have a class polygon, 
All right, so this is defining the general concept of a polygon, right? A multi-sided shape. We've got public virtual void draw. Okay, so what this is doing is saying, I'm defining a method called draw, and it's normal in most ways, right? Usually we would just say like public void draw. We've added this word virtual. So what that word virtual means is that we can define a body for our method, which we do. Okay, we've defined this body. Um, we can define a body for our method. So our method in this case just prints out polygon. Okay, but because it's virtual, we can also override it. Okay, we can also change that method if we wanted to. Okay, we can also change that method if we wanted to. So that's, that's the important thing to get. Okay, that's the important thing to understand. Now, um, let me just think about how to explain this to you. Okay, so um, when thinking about this question, um, I would hope that initially you guys would have answered override, okay? Because this example we've seen exactly, actually, we've seen this example exactly. Okay, so um, if, if I've declared some kind of method as either virtual or abstract, right? I've declared it that way in my base class. Then in my derived class, if I want to change that method, I've taught you guys this idea of override. Okay, we can we can overwrite in a way that method. Okay, but there are some when I initially taught this to you, there are some subtleties, uh, little trick things that that we've left out. Okay, so I have an orthodontist appointment. Um, yeah, yeah, we we were told that that would be the case, Connor. So no problem. Um, and and yeah, just please do catch up or. If you're worried about any of the other questions, make sure you finish the multiple choice by going through the video at some point during the week, please. Yeah, yeah, precisely. Um, what does override mean and do? Okay, cool. So, yeah, um, cool. Let's let's get back to this. Okay, so override will change the base implementation's impl um, version of draw. Okay, so let me show this to you. If I say square dot draw, okay, so I created an object of type square over here. Square has a draw method, right, which it inherits from Polygon. It inherits the draw method from Polygon, but here I have overrided it. Okay, I've overrided it. I use the word override here. Okay. So when I run square dot draw, it doesn't print out Polygon as it would if it was the Polygon's implementation of the draw method. Instead, it prints out square because it's the squares implementation of the draw method, okay? Because I overrided that original implementation. Okay, that this, this you've seen before, this is what override does. This is the one that we have seen, but there are, there are other ways of doing this. Okay, so the, the ones that we have to consider, the words that you would actually use for this are either override or new. Okay, so you guys just have to know the difference between override or new. These are the words that we would use to change the original implementation. Okay. Um, so what we want to see is is what is the difference here? Okay, so you can so do you guys get what override is doing here so far? It's taking this base implementation of draw and it's changing it to this one. Uh, let me show you this way. If I remove this. Okay, so square no longer overrides. Square no longer overrides the implementation of the draw method. You see it prints out polygon. So now it's using polygons version of the draw method, which square is just inheriting. So I say square dot draw and it prints out polygon. Okay, but if I override that initial implementation, then it prints out square. Okay, um, you guys happy with that so far? Wow, 7B. Damn, Uvia. <laughs> okay, but but let's let's just see. But I, I still want to clarify because it might be a there might be a. But yes, so the answer to this question is B. But the difference is so subtle. Okay, that that I wouldn't expect you to know it yet. Okay, so we said override here, and you can see this seems to kind of be achieving what the question is saying. So the question says. The draw method in the square class should provide new functionality, but also hide the polygon class implementation. So what is this doing? It's saying 
all right, it is providing new functionality, right? It is providing new functionality. The original one said polygon, it printed out polygon. This one prints out square. Okay, that's good. It's, it's provided new functionality. What is the second bit? They say should also hide the polygon class implementation of the draw method. Should also hide. They use the word hide here. Okay, so what do they mean? Well, um, let me remind you of this earlier idea, guys. If I say console.writeline, okay, console.writeline, and I say square is square, what will this print out? Can, can any of you guys remind me in the chat? What would that line of code print out? If I say square, so square is my square object, right? And I say is square. What would this what would this line of code here print out? Console dot right line square is square. Anyone remember what that is keyword does? The is operator. It would print out true. Uh, correct. Uh -huh. So, and do you guys remember what would happen if I said square is polygon? Okay, you see it inherits from polygon. Um, what would this line print out now? Would it print out false? I let's let's just run it. So it prints out true, okay? Because what is what this is saying is that all squares are polygons, okay? All squares are polygons. Um, if you think back to our rectangle square example, or even to our eye enemy example, right? We had all of these different types of enemies, okay? We had um, yeesh, I, I don't even remember. We we had lots, right? Werewolves, robots, ninjas, okay? All of these different types of enemies were all different classes, right? If you said nin is ninja, that would say true. But if you said nin is I enemy, that would also say true. Okay, and it's the same logic here. Okay, square is square, that's true. But because it inherits from polygon, it is also polygon. Okay. So we, we did cover this before. It's, it's okay if you forgot, but, but um, this... So this prints out true. All squares are polygons because they inherit from one another. Okay. Where you're correct is if I said class rectangle and I made rectangle also inherit from polygon. Okay. If I said square is rectangle, this will now say false. Okay, it says false. Because rectangle doesn't inherit from square and square doesn't inherit from rectangle. They both inherit from polygon, but they're still different. Okay. Cool. So hopefully this discussion just reminded you of, of how the typing works. So a square inherits from polygon, which means any square object is also a polygon object. This is a true statement. Okay. Um, you can think about it the other way, like our original example of inheritance was we had a person class, a doctor class, and a nurse class. Uh, if, you, if you say doctor is doctor, that prints out true. If you say doctor is person, that prints out true. If you say nurse is nurse, that's true. If you say nurse is person, that's true. But if you say doctor is nurse or nurse is doctor, that's false. Okay, so it's like a, a hierarchy almost. Okay, anyway, so uh, concluding that discussion, hopefully now that you've seen that all squares are polygons, if I say something like this, does this worry you guys? If I say polygon square equals new square, what do you guys think about that? All squares are polygons, right? So if I make something of a polygon type, I can hold a square inside the polygon. That's fine, right? Yeah, it's fine. So we can say polygon square equals new square. And, and when I run this, okay. And this, guys, is where the difference between new and override comes from. Okay. So uh, it's, it's very subtle. So please do concentrate. Okay. So notice, if I say, so let me say square, square equals new square. Okay. And then I say square dot draw square dot draw okay square square equals new square square dot draw this prints out square okay because we have overrided the initial implementation okay if i change the keyword to new so so we've provided new functionality okay i change the new key keyword to new this also prints out square okay so both of them do the same thing 
when when the base class is declared um, or when it's instantiated as a square. Okay. If I change this to polygon, okay, and I use the word override, okay, so now I'm saying polygon square equals new square, then this prints out square still. Okay, so override changes polygon's implementation of draw. Polygon's implementation of draw has been overrighted, if you like. It's gone. It's totally gone. Um, this this variable does not have polygon's initial implementation. Okay, so even though it is of type polygon, polygon square equals new square, it does not have this polygon draw method. When I say square dot draw, okay, it's a polygon. If I say square dot draw, it prints out square. You see that. If I say new, then it prints out polygon. Okay, so what new does is, you see if I make it square again, it'll print out square. So new isn't overwriting the new version, overwriting the original version of draw. Okay, it's just hiding it. All right, it's hiding away polygons version of draw, and it's saying there's also this new functionality. And if you're a square, you'll use this one. If you're a polygon, you're going to use this one. Okay. So in the one case, override, if we use the word override, the original version of, of draw is gone. It's been overrided entirely. If we use the word new, then it's just been hidden. Okay, it's just been hidden. Oops, uh, sorry, oh, right, I made it a square again. Uh, then it's just been hidden. So now it'll print out polygon. Okay. Do you guys understand this distinction? My laptop shut down, sorry, what question are we on? Uh, we're just finishing off question seven. Maybe like watch the interim video um, because we've we've spent a lot of time on question seven discussing it. Um, but for those of you who who did manage to see that, are you guys feeling okay about this difference between override or new? It's very subtle, but but new is hiding away the original implementation. Override is overwriting it. Okay, so you can see in the question they say here. Um, the draw method in the square class should provide new functionality. Okay, well, both override and new can provide new functionality. But then it says, but also hide the polygon class implementation. So they say hide. They don't say overwrite. Okay, so what this is saying, um, it must hide it. So that's what the new keyword would do. Okay, it's it's subtle, but but that's... That's the way it is, if you like. Okay. Is everyone everyone okay with this, though? Okay with the difference between new and override? It's very specific. And like I said, this is why I do still consider, even though you guys are doing well on it, I do const still consider this section the hardest because there's so many little words to learn. Okay, very subtle differences. Okay, so no one said anything, so I assume you guys are okay with this. Um, let's just head on to question eight. Okay, so I didn't write, I didn't type question eight into the slides. Number one, because it's super long, and number two, because it's a bit silly. So um, basically, question eight gives us a good opportunity to revise iComparable. Wow. Damn. You, you, that was fast. Okay, so someone says 8C. And another person says 8a. <clears throat> okay, yeah, there's they're subtly different, but let's let's discuss this. Okay, let's let's just discuss this. Um, cool. So I'm going to set up the question inside our inside. Okay, cool. We're comparing rectangles to one another, so I'm going to create a class rectangle. Okay. I'm going to say class rectangle implements I comparable. Okay, I'm glad you guys haven't been scared off from this that you answered so quickly. That's very cool. Um, and and yeah, let's let's more closely discuss this and and really because this is a good chance to revise this concept. Um, but but I'm glad you guys seem to have remembered it quite well. Okay, they. 
uh, let me just see. Okay, they don't specify the object, so we have to convert it. Okay, cool. And so all we have to do with this, um, let me just create it quickly. So I'm going to say public double length uh, get set. Okay, I'll say public double width get set. And I'm going to say public double area. Okay, I'm just making sure that mine is the same as theirs. Okay, they say get area. Fine, it means the same thing. I'm going to stick to area because it's a little bit simpler to write. And all this does is return length times width. Right, so it'll just go return length times width. Okay, so that's the little example that they've set up. But it inherits from iComparable. So we also have to go ahead and provide an implementation for the compare to method. Okay, that's what it means to inherit from iComparable. You need to implement the compare to method. Okay, they take in an object O. Okay, the reason they take in an object O and not a rectangle is because in order to take in a rectangle, you would have to stay rectangle here. And that means that you're comparing rectangles and so you would take in a rectangle. Okay, a bit of a silly thing um, that they didn't use rectangle here, but let's just stick to, to their example. So they didn't specify, so it just takes in a general object. Okay, cool. Object, ooh, they call their object obj, they don't call it o. Fair enough. Okay, so there we go. We've, we've set up the basic example, and they're just saying, how do we implement the compare to method? Okay, so a couple of things to discuss while we're revising this. Um, what does the compare to method, how many options are there? Okay, if I'm comparing two objects to one another and I want to find out what order they're in, how many objects, how many options are there, guys? How many possible options are there? Three, correct, right? So I'm going to say we're comparing this object to that object. Okay, the three possible options are that this object is before that object in, in the order. The second option would be that they're equal in the order. This object is equal to that object in the order. And the fourth option would be that this object is after this object in the order, that object in the order, sorry. Okay, cool. So those are the three possible options. Pretty simple to visualize in your head, right? If we're creating a list um, of numbers, makes sense. Okay, um, cool. So there, there are three things that this then has to return. Right, if this object is before that object in the order, then it must return negative numbers. Okay, otherwise it, they must be equal, and lastly they should be um, before and after. I mean positive. Okay, so so those are of the three are the three options that we we get. Okay, so in order to see this, I, I do want to just. Um, hmm because they do it in two different ways, which might be confusing for you guys. So I'm just thinking about how I should explain this quickly. Sorry, so. This. Hmm. Okay, cool. So let's do this. So they say rectangle targets equals a uh, rectangle object. All right, so all they're doing on this line is converting the object to a rectangle. Okay, because it's taking in an object object, but we can't work with that. We need to work with the rectangle. Okay, so they convert it to a rectangle. As I explained earlier, you could do, we, we did this in perhaps a better way when, when we did this. Okay, um, in order to explain this, I'm, I'm gonna have to, because they're doing something a little bit tricky and if, if you're still before grade 10 maths, it might seem a little bit strange what they're doing here. If, if we're comparing two objects with a, uh, two numbers to each other even, let's just say um, x e int x equals 10, int y equals 11. Okay, so we're comparing two objects to each other. There are a few ways we could do this, right? We could say if x is less than y, all right? If x is less than y, okay. In this case, 
um, if, if this was true, then we would know that the, the number x is less than the number y. Okay, pretty simple, right? Um, how we could compare if they were equal to each other, we could say equals equals y. How we could compare like the other, the third case, like is y bigger than x, we could say x, um, ooh, sorry, you know what I mean. That's saying x is less than y, this is saying y is greater than x. Okay, so, so those are the ways we can compare these numbers. They, just to make things a little bit complicated, some of the options don't compare numbers in this way. Okay, so hopefully you're comfortable with comparing numbers in that way. But how they do it is they'll say the difference between the two numbers is x minus y. Okay, so in this case, what would this do? It would say int diff equals 10 minus 11. That's minus 1, right? So what we know is if x was less than 0, right, then that would mean that y was bigger than x. Okay. If x was equal to 0, okay, so 11 minus 11 would make them equal. Okay. Then we would have 11 minus 11, that would be 0. Okay. If x was equal to 0, that means the two numbers were equal. Right? Like if they were both 8, then the difference between the two numbers is 0. Okay. Likewise, if x was greater than 0, that would mean that y was less than x. Okay. So I'm just covering this just in case you weren't comfortable with comparing numbers in that way. So in A, that's how they're comparing the numbers. They calculate the difference between the two numbers. If the difference was equal to 0, that means the numbers were equal. Right? It's actually it's it's quite a... It's an interesting way of doing it, but but not the way we did it. Okay, when when we initially did the compare to. All all right. So hmm, our possible options are. Uh, let me just think. How should I explain this? So uh, we have int x equals six, int y equals um, five. Okay, so I'll let me remind you of our possible options. We have this and that. Okay, if this comes before that in the order, we must return a negative number. Okay, minus one. If they're equal in the order, we must return zero. If this is after that in the order, we must return um, a positive number. Okay, so that is before this in the order. Right, so those are our three options. So we, we just need um, if, else if, and else. So we're just analyzing which of these possible options is giving us that, that correct way of going about things. Okay, knowing that, the question itself is not actually that difficult, right? All we need to check is, so they calculate the difference. They say uh, double diff equals okay and and w they'll say this dot area minus um targets dot area okay so that's just calculating the area for each rectangle okay in the first example what do they say they say if diff equals equals zero if diff equals equals zero so this would mean that this area was the same as target.area. That means they're the same in the order, so we must return zero. Okay, so we're good on the first option. If we do else if, okay, what was the second possible option? They say diff greater than zero, diff greater than zero. So what would this mean? That means this dot area was larger than that dot area, right? Target.area. Okay, diff greater than zero. So that means that this dot area comes after that dot area in the order, right? Because it's larger. So we must return one. Okay. And the else then must just return minus one, right? Else return minus one. Okay. So after just going through the first one, we can see that this would work. Okay, this is giving us the correct correct option okay 
in order to but again you would have to go through it slowly just to clarify that you're you're correct um, but let's just spend some time seeing what the others are getting wrong okay so option two let's see what option two gets wrong so b they say if if it's zero they return one else if if it's greater than zero they return minus one and in the last case they return zero okay well we can see this is definitely wrong right because now it's returning a positive number if they were the same so it's not b okay immediately we can see it's not b um, let's check out option c okay in option c they say ooh this is subtle i i can see why we might have gone for this one but I, it, it could be quite <laughs> okay this is tricky guys so look at option C um, so Saham I, I see you picked C and and in a way I can see what you were going for because it's the the reason it's wrong is is quite strange so let me say if, if we say this equals equals target what are we comparing if we say this equals equals target we're not comparing a number right so the the problem with C is that they don't actually get the area anyway they don't calculate the area they're comparing the entire this object to the entire target okay but we know that we have to compare a length a width we have to compare numbers like an area whatever we have to compare numbers to each other we can't compare the entire object okay so even though technically you might say they they return the correct things the reason it's wrong is because they're comparing the entire object instead of comparing um, the specific the specific number can you see that Saham I, I do I understand why you might have um, got C but you can see hopefully now you can see that they're tricking you they were trying to trick you you see okay cool good stuff and and we can see D is doing the same thing right D is also saying this equals equals target but we can't compare the two objects to each other you have to say like this dot length if you want to compare the length or this dot area if you want to compare the area okay so you can't compare the entire object to the entire other object because they're not numbers okay so that's why c and d were wrong and and b yeah and b was just returning one when it was equal equals zero which is obviously wrong um because uh diff equals equals zero means that the two areas were the same which means we must return zero okay so yeah it's a um it, question eight was a Okay, question nine was another silly question that I think warrants more discussion than what you can get in in this. Okay, so question nine. Uh, this this was this was a weird one. I do remember. Okay, so I'm just gonna yeah. Cool. Let's just do this. I'm gonna set up the the question in this way, right? I'm actually let me create a, a class rectangle um, like so, and I'm just gonna give it a name. So I'll say like public string or or length. Okay, something like that. Public ooh string length. That's silly. Let me say int length and public int width so i'm just creating a rectangle object quickly so that i can uh, show you question nine um like what they're actually testing mm. oh they they say process mm. okay cool yeah should be fine so then i'm just gonna say ooh. One second. Ah, no, okay, I won't create a constructor. I'm just going to leave it like that. Okay, cool. So what they're saying is we have this method called process. Okay, so we just, I'm just going to make it static. So I'm going to say static void process. Okay, we, we have this method here. Okay, the process method. The process method takes in an object. Okay, we'll say object O. <coughs> 
Okay, inside the process method, we're going to do something with rectangles. Okay, do something with rectangles. Okay, it might be calculating the area, it might be calculating the overlap, whatever. We're, we're doing something with a rectangle. Okay, do something with rectangles. So in order to do this, we have to be able to convert the object to a rectangle. Okay, we take an object O, we need to change object O to a rectangle. So someone's saying C. I'm glad you say C because, because you recognize the word is, and, and that's good. And, and hopefully adapting from that word to, to the new word that we're going to have to learn um, probably hopefully won't be too difficult. So let's, let's check this out. So I'm going to say rectangle rect equals new rectangle. So I've got a rectangle rect here, right? So I've just created a rectangle object. Hopefully, hopefully we're all comfortable with that. What we need to do is convert rectangle to, I mean, so let me, let me explain it like this. So what I'm going to do is call process. So process is the method, right? It expects me to give it an object. Okay. Rect is an object, right? You can see rect is an object. It's, it's more specific than that. It's a rectangle object, but we it doesn't care about that as long as it's an object. So I'm going to give it rect. Okay. So it's been given a rectangle and this is a valid rectangle. Okay. What it needs to do. So it's saved rectangle rect. It's saved rect into objects. We've, we've seen this happen before. So it's working with an object. As far as it's concerned, it's working with an object called O. It doesn't know what rect is. It's working with an object called O. Okay, so what do we have to do? Um, let's test out their, their different options here. But, but let me read out the question to you guys so, so we know what we're trying to do. So they say, you need to cast this object into the type rectangle. So what they're saying is we have object, we need to convert it to a rectangle somehow. Okay. <clears throat> At times, the value of O that is passed to the method might not be a valid rectangle value. Okay, so what they're saying is sometimes it might not be a rectangle, right? For example, I could say, right, program is a class that I have here as well, right? I have class rectangle, but I also have class program. I could say maybe a uh, program, program prog equals new program, right? I might also have triangles or squares, right? These aren't rectangles. And I, they are still objects, though. So process will accept it as an object. Okay. So that's what they mean there. They're saying at times the value of O that is passed to the method might not be a valid rectangle. So we can understand that. You need to make sure that the code does not generate any invalid cast exception errors while doing the conversions. Which of the following lines of code should you use inside the process method to accomplish the goal? Okay, so I said this question was mean. And I, I think it is mean because it's they're testing a very specific thing <clears throat> that most people I think probably wouldn't have covered. But but in the last sort of nine, we, actually we, we should be able to finish this and question ten hopefully. So let me just speed up a little bit. Okay, <clears throat> cool. So they give us a couple of pop possible options. So one of them would be say rectangle r equals new rectangle. Oh sorry, rectangle r equals rectangle in brackets like this. Oh, okay. So let's try running that. I run that and look, it says system dot invalid cast exception. It says you cannot cast a program to a rectangle. Okay. So this one immediately doesn't work, but hopefully you guys wouldn't have picked this one anyway. Okay. Because you you've never seen it before. So it shouldn't, it shouldn't have concerned you. Okay, this, this question here, this option is put in place to trick people who are very good at C++, because in C++, that's probably how you would have approached that problem. Okay, um, let's go to option C, because Yuvia, you guessed C. Okay, so, so let's say C. So we'll say O is rectangle. Okay, cool. Why, why is this wrong? Hopefully we can see if I say O is rectangle, what does that return? What will that return? 
it, it will return one of two things. What, what are the possible things it could return? What are the possible things O is rect? It could return true or false, right? In this case, O is in fact a rectangle because I passed in rect. So it would return true. But O is the is operator returns either true or false, okay? Which means when you say rectangle R equals O is rectangle, you're making it equal to either true or false. You're not making it equal to a rectangle object. Okay, so can you understand why C wouldn't be the correct solution? Because the is operator returns true or false. Okay, hopefully we can see that. Um, okay, so yeah, Yuvia, if you if you understand why is is not is not a correct solution, please say. Um, the last option is using a ternary operator. Maybe I'll show it to you next week. I'm not sure if we have the time now, but it's too complicated of a solution. Um, oh, Yuvia, you changed your option to B. Okay, cool. And and Saham, you also say 9B. And yes, you guys are both correct. And you could find it earlier in the book, which is, I wonder if you guys did that, if you just went back and read and got the answer. But guys, so if you didn't understand the rest of the explanation, understand this. Okay. Whenever in C sharp, you see them ask you about casting from one type to another, from one object type to another. Oh, you didn't. Okay, cool. Um, then maybe you did it by process of elimination. That's cool too. So if ever in C sharp, you, you get asked to convert from one type to another, the answer of from cast from one type to another without invalid cast exceptions, the answer is always as. Okay. The word as was added to C sharp specifically to solve this problem okay specifically to solve this problem that's why they added the word as okay so you can see if i pass in a rectangle and i say rectangle r um, r equals o as rectangle um, that's going to work and it's not going to throw an error um, when it eventually runs and if i pass in even something that's not a rectangle um, it still shouldn't throw an error when when rex tester eventually decides to run it though Okay, and there is one more question. Hopefully the last one you guys would get quite well if you if you remember our discussion of events and delegates. But let me just see. Um, hopefully, hopefully Rex Tester eventually fixes itself and actually runs this little code example. But the basic thing to learn from question nine is if they ever ask you about casting from one object type to another, okay? You always answer as, okay? The word as was added to C-sharp specifically for that. And you can read it kind of like English, right? You can read it like English. So I want to see this as a rectangle, or as a square, okay? So I want to see this thing, whatever type it is, as this type. So it's kind of similar. It's like an extension of is in a way. Okay, it's timed out. That's unfortunate. Um... I think Rex Tester maybe has too many users. Yeah, too many requests. I guess Rex Tester is very busy at the moment. Okay, luckily we don't need it for the last question, um, and we'll just we'll we'll see what goes on. Okay, so question ten. Maybe we'll go over. Wow. Okay, someone says ten A. Interesting, interesting choice. Let's let's see what what ten A is asking. So they say you are writing code to handle events in your program. Okay. Yeah, we should be able to finish this in four minutes, hopefully. You define a delegate named rectangle handler like this. Public delegate void rectangle handler rectangle rect. You also create a variable of the rectangle handler type as follows. Rectangle handler handler. Later in this program, you need to add a method named display area to the method invocation list of the handler variable. So all they're saying here is basically you're adding an event. Okay, you're adding something that needs to be called during the event. So we had something like notify subs. We also had notify bells. You know, we had a few. The signature of the display area method matches the signature of the rectangle handler method. Cool, that's pretty irrelevant information for us. Any code that you write should not affect any existing event handling code. Given this restriction, which of the following codes should you use? Okay, Yuvia says 10C, Saham says 10A. Okay, um, so the answer is is C, um, but let me just remind you guys of why this is. Um, Saham, I think maybe maybe you read through the question too quickly, 
and so you read it as creating a new object of type rectangle handler or something because then in that case a would look more correct but let me remind you of what they're asking about and then and then hopefully you'll see pretty pretty clearly <clears throat> so i'm going to go ahead and open up um, where we actually saw this so it was in our events and delegates example on rex tester open this up in full screen and so what they're look remember we had this notify subs method okay a new video has been uploaded where we went we were like shouting okay and then and and then the notify subs method saw that a video had been uploaded and then it went and notified the subs okay if you recall this whole example and here we said uploaded dot uploaded plus equals subs dot notify subs okay so i want to discuss why we used plus equals quickly um, just in the last few minutes. So if I have, uh, let me do this in, in the other code wall, because hopefully you guys will be able to see it more clearly. So I'm just going to remove all this nonsense and remove this guy as well. Okay, so if I have like int x equals 10 and, ooh, sorry about that, int x equals 10 and int y equals 11. Actually, you know what, it might even be easier as, Sorry if we go a bit over time for the one hour and 30 minutes. Yo, these new lessons are very short, but we're almost done. Okay, so I'm going to say string y equals g. Okay, and then I'm going to say string z equals x plus y. Okay, and I'm going to print out z. What will this print out, guys? So I have the string do and the string G, and I add them together, what will this print out? I'll just record the rest of the video if you guys... Ooh, uh, sorry, what am I... What is going on here? Embedded token in class structure. Okay, let me just control, control... Oh, oh, right, I deleted the entire method. That was silly of me. Okay, let me go back here. There we go. Control V. Okay, what will this print out, guys? Prints out dog. Okay, cool. So how many you saw that it would print out dog? So it, uh, it just appends the G to the end. Okay, there's a faster way of doing this, right? Like I don't need the variable Z, actually. I could say X equals X plus Y. You agree this is the same? Okay, because now I'm just saying X... Um, overwrite the variable x with whatever x is, which is do, plus whatever y is, which is g. So it still becomes dog. Okay. Uh, oh, right. I print out z still. So now I print out x. You can see x still becomes dog. Okay. I told you that the foster way of writing this, you see I write x twice here. I say x equals x plus y. The foster way of saying the same thing is to say x plus equals y. So we're adding it onto the back, right? If I just say X equals Y, then this will just print out G. Okay. So can you see why we would use, if we want to add a new method to a list, we would add it with plus equals. We wouldn't just say equals, because then if we just say equals, the rest of the list would be gone. Do you understand? And so that's why when we add to an event, we say plus equals. We always say plus equals. So I was hoping because we did when when we did this example originally, um, we did play up this this plus equals sign. So I just want you to remember that that's where this is used um, during event handling. Okay. Are we okay with that? Maybe, okay, maybe those last two questions, we can discuss them more next week because we rushed them a little bit today. Okay, um, cool. I think that is our hour and a half up for today. Um, so I do the, the sort of extra reading for this week. I would like if you guys could read um, page 66 to 68. So just the understanding application lifecycle management section. But don't worry, I'll post all the details on the WhatsApp group and in the description of the YouTube video. Um, but otherwise, yeah, next week we'll be back to the normal time, guys. And and we'll still be using Microsoft Teams because you guys seem to prefer that. And then we'll, yeah, 
cool. Thank you guys for coming. Oh, Connor, we, we yeah, we just finished because remember it's one and a half hours now. Um, but but yeah, we just finished going through the multiple choice test quite quite quickly, and and yeah, we we rushed it a bit. So I'll go over the last two bits at at the at the beginning of tomorrow's lecture, and the extra reading for for this week will be from sixty six to page sixty eight. But I'll post more details in the WhatsApp group, and yeah. And then, yeah, that actually brings us to the end of section two, guys, completely. Um, we won't be, obviously, if you guys have any questions about section two, we're, we'll be happy to discuss them. But, but otherwise, we're done with our theoretical understanding of section two. Um, we do have like a little online assessment, like a Google Forms, like we had last time. Um, but you guys don't have to worry too much about that. Um, maybe just revise any concepts that you're struggling with from section two. Yeah, cheers, guys, and see you next week. Thank you for coming. And yeah, we'll be back to normal times, but I'll keep you posted on the WhatsApp group. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh, yeah. Oh, you're saying thanks, sir. Okay, cool, not, not getting me to stay. Cool, yeah, see you guys next week. I'll post the video and do all the normal stuff. Ooh, I can stop recording now.